What if I told you that one of America's most respected scientists says Bismillah, in the name of Allah, before every single experiment? What if I told you that this same woman, who wears hijab in her laboratory, became the first African-American woman ever to receive the prestigious Charles Darwin Lifetime Achievement Award? You might think this sounds impossible, even contradictory. But for Dr. Fatima Jackson, this isn't just a story. It's her extraordinary reality. This is the tale of a woman who rose from crushing poverty to the pinnacle of scientific achievement, all while discovering that faith and science aren't enemies. They're the most powerful allies imaginable. Picture this. A small house in Denver, Colorado, 1956. The carpet has holes, the walls are thin, and a young girl named Fatima Linda Collier Jackson watches her world crumble as her father dies when she's just six years old. Her mother, barely scraping by, faces an impossible choice. Surrender to poverty or fight for something greater. But here's where the story takes an unexpected turn. This wasn't just any household struggling with poverty. This was a house where three extraordinary women, her mother, grandmother, and aunt, all held master's degrees. In an era when most women never saw the inside of a college classroom, these women had already shattered every ceiling society tried to place above them. The family motto became Fatima's guiding light. We had holes in the carpet, but we had books on the shelves. The idea was, sit down and read, or sit down and think. While other kids played with toys they couldn't afford, young Fatima was exploring the Rocky Mountains, collecting rocks, studying plants, and asking questions that would one day revolutionize science. Her great-grandmother, a Choctaw Native American traditional healer, taught her something profound that understanding nature and healing others wasn't just science, it was sacred. Little did young Fatima know that this lesson would shape everything about her future. Fatima's journey into academia began at the University of Colorado, where she immediately encountered something that would shock you. In the 1960s, anthropology departments weren't just unwelcoming to women of color. They were openly hostile. Professors questioned whether someone like her belonged in science at all. The racism was so blatant, so crushing, that most students would have given up entirely. But Fatima wasn't most students. She made a decision that would change everything. She transferred to Cornell University, one of the most prestigious institutions in America. Here, finally, she found professors who saw her brilliance rather than her skin color. She earned her B.A. cum laude with distinction in all subjects, an achievement so rare that her professors took notice immediately. But Cornell wasn't just where she found academic success. It was where she met Robert Jackson, the man who would become her husband and lifelong partner. And it was where she began to ask the questions that would define her career. How do human genetics interact with the environment? Why are some populations more susceptible to certain diseases? How does evolution actually work in human populations? These weren't just academic questions. They were deeply personal ones, rooted in her observations of health disparities in her own community. In 1974, during her graduate studies, Fatima embarked on research in Tanzania that nearly cost her everything. She was studying malaria, a disease that kills hundreds of thousands every year, trying to understand why some people survive while others perish. But then disaster struck. Fatima herself contracted severe malaria. For days, she lay dying in a remote African village, temporarily blind, unable to walk, her body burning with fever. Local healers worked desperately to save her life, while she drifted in and out of consciousness, confronting her own mortality in the most profound way imaginable. As she recovered, something had fundamentally changed. The woman who emerged from that sickbed wasn't just a scientist studying malaria. She was someone who had experienced firsthand the thin line between life and death, between health and disease. She had seen how traditional African medicine could work alongside modern science. She had witnessed the power of both knowledge and faith in the face of life's greatest challenges. This experience would drive her doctoral research on the relationship between genetic traits and malaria susceptibility. 
work that would later revolutionize how we understand human evolution and disease resistance. But more importantly, it had opened her heart to questions that science alone couldn't answer. Three years later, in 1977, Fatima was deep in her graduate studies at Cornell when something extraordinary happened. She had spent years studying human genetics, evolution, and the intricate relationships between biology and environment. Her mind was sharp, analytical, trained to question everything, and that's exactly what led her to Islam. I was attracted to Islam, she would later explain, because it seemed to me like a thinking woman's religion. You get to think, and you get to keep your own money. This wasn't a conversion born of emotion or desperation. This was the decision of a brilliant scientist who had discovered that Islam didn't just allow intellectual inquiry, it demanded it. The Quran commanded believers to seek knowledge, to study creation, to understand the natural world as a way of understanding the Creator. For Fatima, this was revolutionary. Here was a faith that saw science not as a threat, but as worship. Here was a religion that encouraged the very questions she'd been asking her entire life. But the decision wasn't easy. Fatima knew that converting to Islam in 1977 America would make her academic journey even more challenging. She would face discrimination not just as a black woman in science, but as a Muslim woman in hijab. The stakes couldn't have been higher, yet something deep within her recognized truth when she encountered it. The same intellectual honesty that made her a great scientist now led her to embrace Islam completely. Here's where Dr. Jackson's story becomes truly extraordinary. Most people assume that science and religion must be in conflict. Dr. Jackson discovered the opposite was true. Every morning, she puts on her hijab, not as a barrier to her scientific work, but as a reminder of the sacred nature of her research. Before every experiment, she says, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, acknowledging that her scientific investigation is itself an act of worship. Science tells us how, she explains with the clarity that has made her one of America's most respected anthropologists. Faith tells us why. They're not competing. They're complementing each other in the most beautiful way. Her approach to reading the Quran reflects the same intellectual rigor she brings to her scientific work. She advocates for metaphorical interpretation when religious texts address natural phenomena, explaining, sometimes the metaphor approach is richer than being a literalist, and Islam and modern science can merge to present a holistic view of humanity. This sophisticated theological framework allows her to fully embrace evolutionary theory while maintaining deep Islamic faith. She doesn't see evolution as challenging God's creation. She sees it as revealing the elegant mechanisms through which divine creation unfolds. Dr. Jackson's career achievements are staggering by any measure. She became a professor at UC Berkeley, one of the world's top universities. She developed revolutionary computational tools that provide alternatives to problematic racial categories in health research. Her work on human-plant coevolution has transformed our understanding of how genetic traits interact with environmental factors. But perhaps most remarkably, she became the director of Howard University's W. Montague Cobb Research Laboratory, which houses the world's largest collection of African-American skeletal and dental remains. In this role, she approaches the study of human remains with extraordinary reverence, describing them as precious and irreplaceable. Those two terms, precious and irreplaceable, is the way we should interact with all humans, she explains. But the dead can't protect themselves the way living people can, so we have to be especially careful. This ethical framework, deeply informed by her Islamic faith, has made her a leader in developing respectful protocols for studying human remains. Her Muslim belief in the sanctity of the human body has actually enhanced her scientific work, not hindered it. In 2020, something unprecedented happened. Dr. Fatima Jackson became the first African-American woman ever to receive the Charles R. Darwin Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of physical anthropologists. Let that sink in. The most prestigious award in her field, named after the father of evolutionary theory, given to a devout Muslim woman who says Bismillah before every experiment. The irony is beautiful. The scientific establishment was recognizing not just her groundbreaking research, but the fact that her Islamic faith had made her a better scientist, not a worse one. Her belief in the sacred nature of creation had led her to approach human remains with unprecedented respect. Her conviction that seeking knowledge is an act of worship had driven her to discoveries 
that purely secular scientists had missed. Standing at that podium, wearing her hijab, Dr. Jackson represented something revolutionary, proof that the highest levels of scientific achievement are not only compatible with deep religious faith, they're enhanced by it.